And please stand, if you would, in honor and reading of God's Word. I'm going to read John 8, 12 through the end of the chapter. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And your law is written that, on, that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, no, you know ne- neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. For for where I am going, you cannot come. So the the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you, you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man... Then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. And He was saying these things, as He was saying these things, many believed in Him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we, we are Abraham's, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? 
Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say to you that I do not know Him, I would be a liar, like you. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not fifty years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. There is one sin that will ruin your soul. It is the one sin that there's no coming back from. If you die in this sin, all eternity is lost to you. And all that remains is eternal separation from God, God's goodness, the joy of knowing God for eternity. This place is known as hell. This place, according to Jesus, is a place of eternal torment. It's a place where God is present, but only in wrath. Wrath for all eternity. Some would say, why speak of such a thing? We are too advanced in our civilization to talk about such a thing as hell. That's too out of touch with this world. That's unloving even to speak of such a thing as hell. I disagree. It is loving to warn men of such a dreadful place and state as this. An eternal separation from God, but experiencing His presence only in wrath for all eternity. It's loving. If a blind man were walking on a ledge to his Impending doom. Is it not loving to warn him of the cliff? So what is it then? What is this one sin that is sure to ruin your soul that there is no coming back from? There is no coming back from this sin. It is the sin of unbelief. It is the sin of unbelief. And today what we're going to look at in our text, we're going to focus in on verses 13 to 30. We're going to look at four ways unbelief is revealed. These could even be called characteristics of unbelief. But four ways unbelief is revealed. These four ways unbelief is revealed, they they emerge from our text today and they're universal. What I mean by universal is these truths transcend time. These ways unbelief reveal themselves, they transcend time. They're revealed here in this text by these Pharisees, these opponents of Jesus, and they have been revealed all through history, and they're revealed even now today, even this morning. They're present in all, even those who would reject Christ as King today. Our text reveals what unbelief looks like. And in fact, if you remember the purpose of why John wrote this gospel, the gospel of John, he tells us, we don't have to wonder, at the end of the gospel in verse 20, in chapter 20, 30 through 31, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you have, may have life in his name. John wrote this entire book, and he structured the book and put in the different encounters, these conversations Jesus is having, all of the different miracles that are here. He's hand-selected them for one purpose, and that's to compel you to believe. That's why he wrote the book. So even the structure of it, we ought to pay attention to. If you are already a Christian today, hopefully, Lord willing, that's the majority of you, what then is this text for? Well, it solidifies your faith and keeps you in belief. It keeps you believing and persevering to the end. And so I'll reorient you to John. We've been in John for a long time, working our way through it verse at a time. And now we've come to this section of 8, 12 through 30, which is really part of a larger section, which we just read all of it. That's, That's 12 through 59, a big section. And I think you can hear the back and forth that's happening, right? I'll give you a summation of what's happening. Jesus has just stood up and declared in verse 12, Remember, he stands up. It's the Feast of Booths, and he's standing in the temple area, the temple treasury. They're celebrating the pillar of fire by night that that used to guide them in the Old Testament in their wilderness wanderings, this pillar of fire, and they've lit these torches in the temple, which pictures that. And Jesus stands up there in that place and says, I am the light of the world. 
That's verse 12. We spent an entire week on verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And now, coming off of that great pronouncement of Jesus, we see this response of these Pharisees. And they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Jesus speaking, they're, they're trying to give a rebuttal or make an objection. They're blind. They can't see Jesus as the light. And so, when chapter 9 begins, what do we see? We see a miracle of Jesus giving the gift of light to a blind man. It's this miracle in chapter 9, what we'll see, is a, it's like a living example of what is wrong with these Pharisees. They're spiritually blind and darkened and lost in unbelief. And so usually, you know what we would do is we would work through systematically one verse, next verse, next verse. But if we do that today, we run this risk that we're going to re-go over again what we went over in detail in chapter 5. But if we do that, we'll miss um, what John is wanting us to see. Because in a narrative passage, passage, what John wants you to see is revealed in the narrative itself. And I think what is jumping out at, at us to see is this unbelief of these Pharisees and those that oppose Jesus. So we're going to move through and we're going to focus in on that, on these people, those rejecting Christ. And we're going to see how unbelief is revealed by them. And it's universal. It transcends time. So many of what we encounter, much of what we encounter comes up again. We encountered it in John chapter 5. These same objections come up, and the same things Jesus says, he says again. But I think why this big section is because that's, John wants us, he wants to compel us to believe. And one of the ways he's going to do it is he's going to expose your unbelief by making you look at their unbelief. So my purpose today is to help you navigate these verses, to see, don't miss the forest for the trees, don't get stuck. John is revealing to you what unbelief looks like. And we clearly see it here today. We're going to see it in four ways it's revealed in 13 through 30. So first, the first way unbelief is revealed is in wrong judgment. If you look at verse 13, the Pharisees, the religious rulers, that's who speaks up. So the Pharisees said to him, these are the ones who are supposed to know the law, the Old Testament. They're supposed to have it all down packed. They know it all. They speak in response to what he just said in verse 12. And what do they say? You're bearing witness about yourself and your testimony is not true. And you remember the very same thing came up in chapter 5. And you remember what Jesus did in chapter 5? He went into this long um, explanation and he brought forth and paraded all of these witnesses forward in John chapter 5. At that time, he brought forward John the Baptist. John the Baptist has more than witness about me. You say, I'm bearing witness about myself. Let's look at these witnesses. John the Baptist, the pre-runner to Christ, he bore witness concerning me. He said, I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's greater than me because he was before me. And then Jesus brought forward his miracles. The miracles that I do, they bear witness about me. And then the scriptures. He said, the scriptures bear witness about me. In John 5, 39 to 40, he said this to them. You search the scriptures. These are the ones who are supposed to know the whole Old Testament. Every word of it. They might have memorized some of it. He says to them, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. Refuse to come. It's a matter of their willingness. They're blinded in their unbelief, so much so that they can't see that the Scriptures are bearing witness clearly about Christ. They miss Him completely. It's as if, if you remember back then, we said he, you're standing upon the Empire State Building, and instead of looking out the window and seeing through the window and seeing the beauty of the landscape, you stand up there and you marvel at the window. That's what these Pharisees are doing. They're marveling at the Old Testament. They're, they're examining the window, but they can't see the purpose of the window, which is to point them to Christ. So they miss Him. They're not willing to come to Him. And then lastly, Jesus says clearly, the Father Himself, He bears witness about me. And here we are again. They say, how can you say these things? You're bearing witness about yourself. So instead of rehashing it again, Jesus 
reveals what the problem, what the real problem is. And the problem has to do with their judgment. They're unable to judge accurately. Well, look at what he says in verse 14 first. I want you to see this. Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. Why? Because light needs no one to bear testimony about it. Light is self-evident. This is why the military engages in light discipline, right? You're in the, in the military. You don't light a bonfire at night because it can give away your position. You, you don't even smoke a cigarette at night because the enemy can see you from miles away because of that little bitty piece of light. Light does not need anyone to bear testimony about light. Light is self-authenticating, and that's the point. Light bears witness about itself, and its testimony is true. The sun does not need anyone to bear witness to it. It's there. The only people that cannot see light are those that are blind. And that's exactly the problem. They're spiritually blind, hence the miracle that's about to take place in chapter 9. And Jesus says to them, your problem is ignorance. You don't know where I come from, verse 14. Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from, where I'm going. You don't know even these two things. You don't even know where I come from, and you don't know where I'm going. And then in verse 19, you know neither me nor my Father. You don't know the Father. To know the Father is to know the Son, and to know the Son is to know the Father. You know me nor the more my father, you're completely ignorant. Now, compare these Pharisees, these religious leaders and experts, to John's testimony in John, 30, John 3, 31 through 35. He makes it very clear. He knows where Jesus comes from. Listen to what he says. 31, 331. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet no one receives his testimony, which is what's happening here in chapter 8. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. So to deny Jesus' self-authenticating ministry is to deny God. For he whom God has sent utters the very words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. John the Baptist knows very clearly where Jesus comes from and where he's going, that he's above all. These Pharisees are blind to it. And the problem is verse 15. The problem is they judge according to the flesh. You judge according to the flesh. Now, we won't get into when Jesus says, I judge no one. We've already, we've already gone over that many times. If you want to reference John chapter 3, the sermon's there. We can, you can reference that. Jesus came the first time not to judge, but to save. He will return again to judge. But he's here not to judge now. But he says to them, here's your problem. You judge according to the flesh. Let me explain this. They're judging according to human appearances. Here's what they see. Here's a man. He's unassuming. There's nothing miraculous about him. He's from the middle of nowhere. We don't even know if he has authentic genealogy. There's nothing great about him that we can see with our eyes. They're judging according to the flesh. In chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus told them already, Do not judge by appearances, judge with right judgment. But they can't execute right judgment because they have rejected God's revelation of himself. And this is the problem. God has given this authentic revelation of himself in Christ. In 5, he had paraded all these witnesses before. Jesus says he bears witness about himself. It's true because it's self-evident. Because they have rejected God's revelation, now they have no way to even judge rightly. All they have left is judging according to the flesh, which is judging with absolute blindness. Unbelief always manifests itself in this way. Always. That man has become the judge of God. See, God has given a revelation about himself. And man stands proudly in his, in his self-autonomous, willed life and says, I will use my judgment and my faculties to judge God's revelation. 
I stand as a self-willed man over God. And if I have judged this revelation not to be adequate, then it must not be true. That's judging according to the flesh, and it's never changed all through time. Because when God speaks, He speaks with absolute authority, but self-autonomous man stands on his own and tries to judge God and God's revelation of Himself. To judge according to the flesh is to judge according to the world system, according to how man judges. And the problem is that we are fallen in sin and spiritually blind, and we cannot execute sound judgment because we're spiritually blind. This is like a blind man trying to judge if light is real or not. He will judge according to the standards he has. And if you are lost in unbelief, you're blind and you cannot judge God's revelation. You're in no place to stand over God's revelation of himself. A judge according to the flesh is like a blind man trying to tell you the beauty of a rose by filling its stem and running into its thorns. Their judgment according to the flesh, it's skewed and tainted by their sin and their rejection of God. That's why Jesus has said earlier in in 6.63, they judge according to the flesh in 6.63. He says, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But they reject this self-authenticating testimony. Verse 18, it's really incredible what Jesus says. I am the one who bears witness about myself. Well, what does that mean? Just so you can see how blind they are. He said many things like this. I am the one who bears witness about myself. This is the words ego eimi in Greek. And Jesus chooses his words very carefully because this pattern, ego eimi, is repeated numerous times in your Old Testament in reference to Yahweh. And Isaiah 43, 11, I'll give you one example. Isaiah 43, 11 says, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And so Jesus uses these words where he says, I am the one who bears witness about myself. Can it be any more clear what he's saying? Ego eimi, I am. I bear witness about myself, so of course it's true, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. But they judge according to the flesh. They see Jesus just as an unassuming poor man, a carpenter by trade, just an just a everyday, everyday folk from the country, from the backwoods. They judge how man judges. And so they miss who Jesus is because they refuse to listen to God's authenticating witness. They refuse to listen to God's witness concerning Christ and have placed themselves above God to cast judgment upon what, how God has revealed himself. And that's the first way unbelief reveals itself. It reveals itself in wrong judgment or judging according to the flesh. And all unbelief, even today, commits the same sin. So second, First, the first way of unbelief reveals itself is in wrong judgment. You must listen to God's revelation of Himself. You can't be like a blind man trying to explain light when you're spiritually blind. You need revelation given to you. Second, unbelief is revealed by self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by self-righteousness? This, this, this are those, these are those who believe they are right with God based off of their own work. So a self-righteous person says, I've done this or that thing, you can fill in the blank, and God accepts me because of that. Or a person will say, I've never met a person when I I talk to them, they say, are you a good or bad person? They always say, I'm a good person. I'm more good than bad, and because I'm more good than bad, God's going to accept me. That's self-righteousness. The belief that because of something in you or a work you've done, or your commitment, or your zeal, or whatever it is, God will accept you. That's you being self-righteous. That's you making yourself right with God. And unbelief will always reveal itself as self-righteousness. That's very much the religion of America. Not just cultural Christianity, which it is of that, but of all other religions as well. People think they're good, and God will accept them. 
At the end of the day, God will accept them because at the core of who they are, they're good. Now, there's, there's a, a, an illustration that comes to my mind. When I was back in Kansas, we were doing some door knocking, and this guy just let me into his house. And he's chain smoking away, and, and he's asking like hundreds of questions. And so I'm, I'm answering the questions, I'm throwing them back. And so finally it gets down to this. He says, well, I don't need Jesus to be good. I'm already good. And so I said, well, you're probably good. I don't doubt that you're good according to the world's standards, but you're not good. Romans 3, 9 through 18 says this about us. It's the truth of who we are. What then, are, the, are, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we are already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, that's everybody in the world, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And then it gets even worse. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and in the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is God's description of us. And what you think of us doesn't really matter, because when God speaks, it's over. How are you going to self-justify when God has that view of you? doesn't matter what you think of yourself. That's what God thinks of you. But back to our text. Why do I say unbelief is revealed in self-righteousness in this passage? Well, if you look back at what Jesus says, starting in verse 20, 21, this is the second time he said something similar to them. He says, so he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Now, what do they say? Now, get this. This is incredibly arrogant. So they say, and you should get in your mind, like they're joking and they're, they're laughing and they're mocking Jesus when they say this. This is not, this is not serious. He said, they say, will he kill himself? Since he says I'm, where I'm going, you can't come. Will he kill himself? You see, because in the Jewish mind, to commit suicide was to, I mean, sign your own hell warrant. It's one of the worst sins you could ever commit. So if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. And so why, are they, why it's so funny to them? Why it's funny is because there is not even the smallest thought in their mind that they will ever end up in hell because they're so incredibly self-righteous. They said the only place Jesus could ever go that will never go is to hell. So maybe he's going to kill himself. And they're laughing and they're mocking. Do you see the self-righteousness of these Pharisees? And these leaders of the Jews, they are trusting so much in their own works. They think they're so good that a holy God will accept them based off of their works. They're willing to mock God in the flesh and tell him, are you going to kill yourself? Because that's the only place we can't go. So they mock Jesus. They're self-righteous. No one thought or brought to mind the words of Isaiah, that all of our works are filthy rags before a holy God. They think their their works are pristine. And in Matthew 5.20, Jesus would say something that we ought to take big note of in, in our lives. These men who the world looked at as righteous and good and those deserving of heaven. Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, these men here... You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness, these people have been put on a pedestal as what people think it means to be living righteous life and morally good. Unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Which means they're not, because they are of insufficient righteousness. Which is bringing it back to this man. I don't need Jesus to be good, according to whose standards? Because according to Jesus, your righteousness must exceed the scribes and Pharisees. Which then makes us ask the question, how do we get anything like that? How do we get a righteousness like that? And if you remember from Philippians, Paul, a one-time Pharisee, what did he say? We talked last Sunday, Dr. Nettles talked about it. I have considered all these things loss, rubbish, that I may gain Christ and have a righteousness that's not mine, not my own. 
that God would give you as a gift the righteousness of Christ and make you in his eyes good. That he would justify you. Well, the first way unbelief is revealed is by wrong judgment. The second way unbelief is revealed is by self-righteousness. The self-righteous have no need of a Savior. They have no need of Jesus' work. They're good on their own. But the third way unbelief is revealed is in a love for the world. Verse 23, You are of this world. I am not of this world. Their unbelief is revealed by a fundamental attachment to this world. For if they were not of this world, they would recognize Jesus and believe Jesus. In John's Gospel, John is not doing this. Don't think this. When Jesus says, I am not of the world, you're of the world, and I'm from above, you're below, and John says the same things. Remember when John said this in chapter 3? Don't think in like the Greco-Roman Plato way, which means, hey, there's this physical world and the material created universe, and then there's this place where people fly around like angels and spirits, and that's where Jesus says he's from. Because that's not what's going on in John's Gospel. John's Gospel has... This world, which is physical, but what the world represents in John is is a created order in rebellion against the Creator. All the people, all the systems of this world, all the things, we love our world and our systems, and we're in rebellion against our Creator. Now, Jesus is not from this world. Jesus is from the created order that is functioning and living according to God's will. You'll remember as we have gone through John, this has come up repeatedly. I'll just bring you back up to speed. In chapter 1, verse 9, speaking of Jesus in, in 1, 9 through 13, you can flip there if you want and read it for yourself. It says this, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He comes into the world as light. I am the light of the world. And the world does not receive him. The world rejects him. But some who are not born of their own will, they're born of God's will, become children of the light. They become God's children. And then in John 3.16, which is many people's favorite Bible verse, John 3.16. Now, don't bring to it the wrong idea. I'll explain it in a minute. Just You have to wonder at what's going on in these passages. Come desensitized to it, because we think, of course God loves the world. He loves everyone. For God so loves the world, so loved the world He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, don't truncate the verse down to, of course, that means God loves every single person, Because the world here in John does not just mean that. It means the entire created order in rebellion against God. A dark, devious, sinful place in rebellion against the Creator. That's the world. Then we're reminded again of the hostility of those that God loves toward Himself in John 3, 19-20. We've seen God's love, and then 3, 19-20 revealed to us man's love. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than the light, because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. That's man's love. That's the world's love. The light has come into the world to save, and the world loves darkness and sin. So they reject their creator, they reject the light. You see here, Jesus, he is, he is stating, you Pharisees are part of this world's system. You're part of the system of the world. You're from below. This world, I'm not from here. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. But they love the world. They love the world and therefore they hate the light. Because if they come to the light, 
their self-righteousness and their, and their works of sin and all of these things will be exposed. So they have an attachment and a love relationship with the world and with the darkness. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They love it. They're not, they're not from where Jesus is from. They're from this world. And if you're here today, you may be caught up in this world system as well. If you don't know Christ, if you've not come to Him by faith, you're part of this world. And many of you here now today may have heard the gospel many times and you don't come to Christ because you love this world and you love darkness and you love your sin. And you know if you come to Christ that you must die to it all. You will either love one and hate the other, but you cannot love the world and love Christ. And they love the world. So the first way unbelief is revealed is by wrong judgment. The second way unbelief is revealed is by self-righteousness. The third way unbelief is revealed by, is by a love and a fundamental attachment to this world. The fourth, unbelief is revealed by a denial of the truth of who Jesus is. Now, as I told you before, we're not going to hit every single verse because I don't want you to miss what is occurring in their rejection of Jesus Verse 24, listen to this strong testimony. I told you, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am He. And, and if you just said just Greek, what it says is this. Listen to it this way. I told you, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Where did he get that terminology? Why does he say that? Well, if you remember the Old Testament, the first time God ever revealed himself in the way of giving his name was to Moses at the burning bush. Do you remember that? When God called this man Moses out of nothing good he had done, but had chosen him and calls him, he reveals himself in a way never had before. This bush is burning. It's not consumed. It's just burning. It speaks of God's eternality, of his self-sufficiency, that he needs nothing. It just burns. It's not consumed. And he commissions Moses to be his prophet, to go to get his people, to free them from Pharaoh, and he doesn't want to go. And he says, well, who am I going to tell him sent me? And he reveals himself in a way he never has before. He reveals his name. This is what happens. Exodus 3.13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people. I am has sent me to you. And here is Jesus. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. What a statement. What a profound statement. But what a profound denial on their part of who Jesus is. Unbelief always reveals itself in this way. Look what they say, mockingly. Verse 25, who are you? Don't don't consider that a legitimate question. They're still mocking. Who are you? He's been telling them, all along who he is. He's already, John chapter 5, how did he say? I speak the words of God. He has identified himself as one with the Father so many times. And here they are. Who are you? It's a fundamental denial of who Christ is. Who is he? Who is Jesus? He's a good teacher. Everyone has to grapple with this question. Who is he? Who is the man who altered world history? Who has more books written about him than any other person in human history? Who has more followers than any person in human history? Whose followers have been killed more than any other in human history? Who don't kill people to make disciples? Who give their life up to make disciples? Who is he? Just a man? Just a good man? Just a, just a moral example, maybe. Someone who has some good advice. Just a good teacher? Just a prophet? Just another prophet like Muhammad, but a little less warlordy. No. What does he say? I am. He says he's God in the flesh. Walking and talking and teaching, he's the light of the world. 
declaring himself to be the light of the world. But they don't see him. They don't see him. They're so blind in their unbelief and blind in their sin. And the same is true today. The same is true today. But what does he say to these spiritually blind? In 8, 28 through 30, we see, and you should take note of this, this is a prophecy of Jesus concerning his own death. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. As He says these things, many believed in Him. We'll talk about them next week. But a prophecy of His own death. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, this is where John is going, where later we'll see where Jesus asks the Father to glorify Himself, and He says, I will, I have done it, and I will do it again. The lifting up of the Son from the earth on the cross is the glorification of the Son. And He says to them, then you will know that I am He. What does that mean? Does that mean that everybody that's there present is going to know and trust Christ? Well, obviously, it doesn't mean that. But some will. Some of them will know. And what a time to know that they have crucified their own Messiah. Many of them in Pentecost would repent and follow him. 3,000. Even the Greeks would believe at his crucifixion. Listen to this. Those who crucified him in Mark fifteen thirty seven to 39 And Jesus uttered a loud cry. He breathed his last while he's hanging there on the cross. The curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And then the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last. He said, truly this was the Son of God. When I am lifted up, when you have lifted me up, you will know that I am he. But what else? What else is there? What else, beloved? There is a time, long time gap, but eventually all will know that He is. Philippians 2, 8-11 through 11 speaks of this day. Even if you're here and you remain in your unbelief, Jesus says, you'll die in your sins, but even you will know that He is and profess that He is. Philippians 2, 8-11 through 11 speaks of Christ this way. Being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. There will be no unbelief anymore, but it will be too late for many, and maybe for you. You will profess truth, you will believe, but it will be too late for you. Well, we've seen four ways unbelief is revealed today. Unbelief is first revealed in wrong judgment. Man places himself above God, tries to judge with the human faculties what God has said concerning himself and many times just dismisses it because the autonomous man does not listen to God, does not want to listen to God. It's like a blind man trying to, to tell you about the beauty, as we said, of a rose by, feel, by feeling its thorns. And then second, unbelief is revealed in self-righteousness. Third, unbelief is revealed in a love of the world. Fourth, unbelief is revealed in a denial of the truth of who Jesus is. Now, as we get ready to wind this down, some application for us. Those of the early church were called atheists. Did you know that? They were called atheists by the Romans. They were accused of atheism. Why on earth would the Christians be charged with atheism? Well, because early Christians did not believe in the pantheon of the gods. They did not believe in the Greco-Roman gods. They knew they were false. They did not believe in them. They professed one God in three persons, Father, Son, and the Spirit, and the kingship of Christ over all creation. They had a saying that Caesar was Lord and Savior. The Christians said, no, Jesus is Lord and Savior. You can imagine how well that went over. So they called them atheists, and they were worried that the gods were going to get angry because all these Christians were spreading everywhere, and the, no one was worshiping the gods anymore because these Christians, these atheists, were pulling them away. Christianity was decimating the gods of that age with truth. So they were atheists. They were fundamentally unbelievers, these Christians. 
Today, however, I feel that kind of badge of honor that Christians were unbelievers of the Roman gods has taken a seriously bad twist. I fear that cultural Christianity lives within the realm of what can only be categorized as unbelief. Cultural Christianity can only be categorized in this way. It is unbelief, not in false gods, but in the one true God. I know this is a pretty audacious claim, a pretty serious allegation, that cultural Christianity is fundamentally unbelief in the one true God, but I want to show you how it is, because it reveals itself in the same way as these Pharisees have revealed their unbelief. Number one, cultural Christianity judges according to the flesh. When you hear someone say something like this, that professes to be a Christian, well, I know that's what you say about God, but that's not what I believe about God. Or when you hear someone say, well, yes, the Jesus that I know would never say that, and he would never do that. You can look them square in the eye, and you should, and say, yes, I know. Because your God and your Jesus does not exist. They're a figment of your imagination. They're a social construct. Where did they get these ideas about God and Jesus from? Not from the Bible. Not from God's perfect revelation of himself. They got it from human construct and from their imagination and their feelings. And it's created this culture, this idea of who God is. And now they judge according to the flesh how God has revealed himself. And they dare say such things as, my God would not do that, even though God has already revealed that he did do it. That's judgmental, they say to you. That's judgmental. You can't confront me with that truth. That's not judgmental, is it? That's, that's loving. Cultural Christianity worships an idol. You want to know how I know for sure? For sure? Uh, this past week, I couldn't believe it. I can't believe, number one, that I did not flip my vehicle over when I heard this on the radio um, or rip my steering wheel out of the column. I'm driving, turning, toot, toot, you know, hits K Love. K Love comes on, and they hear this guy, Where's God when bad things happen? And this guy calls in on the radio, and he's like, Hey, you know, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and God's in us. And so that's where he is. He's with us when these bad and terrible things happen. When we're hurting, God's heart is broken too, and He's hurting. And then one of the one of the people, right? These are like the bishops of the cultural Christian world on the radio. He says, "Guys, you know what? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we ought to take time and just pray for God." What do you like? I was waiting. I was like, "Is there?" I'm waiting for the burst of flames to happen on the radio right now. It didn't come because God is gracious and merciful. But pray for God? What God is this? What God needs you to pray for Him? Because His feelings are hurt. And then, and then who are you going to pray to for God? Because whoever you're going to pray to, that's God. And this thing that you've created, that's not God. I've told you before, I've said before, the God that most Christians worship is not worth the loose change in my pocket. And I never carry change in my pocket. That's the cultural Christianity. It, it is man judging God, creating the social construct of who he is. Second, cultural Christianity is a self-righteous system. Whereas the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel the disciples went out, were willing to die for and preached, that's salvation by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. What is this gospel that's preached today? But just a a washed, a kind of cleaned up version of Phariseeism, Pharisaicalism. That's what it is. Do this and you will be a Christian. This Christianity sits in an ivory tower and judges the culture. Passes judgment on the, le- the, the least pious. They're less pious than us. I haven't done enough. Why are they Christians? Because at one point in time they did something to become a Christian. They'll tell you that. Not because God has saved them by faith alone. And why are they trusting in Christ for eternity? Why do they believe that? Because they have performed enough. They've performed enough. They're a good husband. They're a good father. Good kid. They haven't done the things other people have done. According to the recent Lifeway and Ligonier study that was released last year, 
78% of professing Christians believe that he or she must contribute to their own salvation. Did you hear what I said? 78% of professing Christians believe they must contribute. What does that mean? Let's just think about this word. What does it mean that you must contribute to your salvation? Well, very simply, it means this. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was not sufficient to secure your salvation. So you must supplement Christ's work with your own. It says his death is insufficient. It's a scary time that we live that we live in. Third, cultural Christianity looks just like the world. Cultural Christianity looks just like the world. It's entertainment driven. It's based on personalities. It's based it's authority and powerful and charismatic leaders. It's obsessed with money. And the people of cultural Christianity, they live and look just like the world. There's literally no difference. Holiness, that's out the window because you might lose some friends if you attempt to separate yourself from the world. And I'm not talking about no drinking, no smoking, and no tattoos. That's a very, that's a very shallow, superficial view of holiness. But to be set apart and live your life for Christ, separate from the world... No one's interested in that anymore, because that could cost you some friends. Your family might not talk to you anymore. Cultural Christianity looks just like the world because they're part of the world. They love the world. They're still in the world. Fourth, cultural Christianity denies the truth of who Jesus is. That same Ligonier Lifeway study shows that 43% of people... They disagree with this statement. Salvation is found in Jesus alone, which is a fundamental statement of who Jesus is. It's a fundamental denial that he is I am. It's a denial that I am incarnated in human flesh, the second person of the Trinity, lived a perfect life for us that we could never live, satisfied the demands of the law in our place, died on a cross for our sins, and then gives us his righteousness as a gift. Salvation found in other places is a denial that Jesus is, I am. We're not talking about Mormons who deny that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. We're not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that he's Michael the Archangel. We're talking about professing evangelical Christians that deny that salvation is found in him alone because of his very nature of who he is. It's, these are scary times we're living in. And what's also scary is that when we, those of us who do follow Christ, when we fall into sin, we manifest unbelief in one of these ways. Do you realize that? All of us who are legitimately converted through that Christ has called us and saved us, when we disobey God, we manifest unbelief in one of these four ways. We are there one at that time. I've placed ourselves as judge over God and have not believed what he has said concerning how we are to live our life. Two, we believe that we are sufficient on our own and don't need Christ in their continuing of our sanctification and have attempted to live this life on our own power, which has led us to falling into sin. Three, We have fallen in love with something of the world. Four, we're denying the truth of who Jesus is. Because if Christ has told us, love your wife like Christ loved the church, if he says that to us in his word, and he is, I am, then we're to obey it without hesitation. Are we not? So when we fall into sin, we are denying and manifesting unbelief in one of these four ways. I pray that we would press on to to know Christ and to follow Him and to leave our sins of unbelief behind. But if you're here today and you are not a Christian, I want you to listen very carefully to Jesus' words. Listen to what He said very carefully. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. There's only two ways to die. That's it. Now, people may die a gazillion different ways, circumstances, but there's fundamentally only two ways to die You're either going to die in your sin, or you're going to die in Christ. Take heed of what he says also. It's a a warning. It's 
a little mysterious, but I believe what he says is true. There will come a time when you will seek for me and you will not find me. Whether that's here, maybe God has been calling to you in the gospel. You've heard the gospel so many times and you will not respond to the gospel. And then one day he says, fine, go your own way. And then later in life, you try to seek for Christ and there is no finding him because he's left. His mercy and his grace is mercy and grace and he doesn't have to give it to you. Not for one day. So if he stops giving it to you, that's what you deserved all along. So many people think tomorrow, tomorrow will be the day that I'll come to Christ. I'll live my life if I'm a young man now. I'll live my life and sow my wild oats. I'll follow Christ later in life. There may not be later in life for you. You will die in your sins. 2 Corinthians 6, 1-3 says this, Working together with them, we then appeal to you, do not receive the, God, the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. And there is no obstacle in your way today. So there may be no fault found in my ministry. Here is Christ, died for your sins, crucified, buried, and raised for your justification. I have presented him to you. He calls all to believe, repent of their sins, and to come to him. And there is no barrier in your way. And unless you believe who he is, you will die in your sins. This is not for tomorrow. This is not for next week. This is for today. As the word says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Come to Christ today. Leave your unbelief and come to Christ and you'll find a great Savior. He'll save you just like you are and He'll change your life. He'll give you a new life. He'll give you His righteousness and He'll make you His child. I pray that you would so today. Let's pray.